become your 24-hour news source. Frank Robertson, Kelly Ring, Roy Leaf's Weather, Andy Hardy on Sports, Channel 13 Eyewitness News at 11. That it, is, that it is most unlikely that the president has any intrinsic heart disease. Doctors say tonight that President Bush's heart trouble over the weekend wasn't a problem with his heart at all. Good evening, I'm Frank Robertson. And I'm Kelly Ring. In our top story tonight, the president's health. He is going back into the hospital tomorrow morning. Doctors tonight have pinpointed the cause of President Bush's irregular heartbeat. They blame it on a thyroid condition and say it is easily treated. President Bush was hospitalized on Saturday. He suffered shortness of the breath while jogging. Doctors found the president had an irregular heartbeat. Yesterday, he returned to work at the White House wearing a heart monitor and taking medication. Doctors tonight say the thyroid condition is easily treatable through a number of methods. Radioactive iodine treatment. The second treatment could be antithyroid medication that we use in some cases for a short period of time and in some cases for a longer period of time as long as several months or a year. And the doctor will go back into Bethesda Naval Hospital tomorrow for some more tests. Police in Riachir are enforcing a 10-hour curfew tonight in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood in Washington, D.C. This after two nights of violence prompted Sunday night when police shot a man during his arrest. Many of those rioters were teenagers. Every 100 hours, more teenagers die on the streets than were killed in the Persian Gulf War. Experts warn that teenage violence is reaching epidemic proportions. Denise White is here now to take a closer look. It is an extremely serious problem. Today, America's major cities are riddled with the violent acts of adolescence. Violent crime by juveniles has risen nine straight years in a row. It is not just happening in our major cities. In fact, we need look no further than our own backyard. In Washington tonight, police are on guard. Rioting youth have kept the nation's capital awake and afraid for two nights now. Leave the premises of the street area or face arrest. Other cities are trying to cope with gang violence. It's doubled in the last five years. But gangs aren't the only outlets for teenage violence. A 14-year-old from St. Petersburg pleads guilty to raping a girl at his middle school. Three Pasco County teens are charged with raping a 79-year-old woman and beating her husband. And just days ago, this group of teens claimed they were brutally attacked by other kids on Davis Island's beach. These children have a deep inner rage. They are very angry with other human beings due to their early experiences or lack of them. Joanne Doyle is trying to teach educators how to deal with chronically violent kids. She says they're a product of early abuse and neglect. For coverage you can count on 24 hours a day. Frank Robertson. Kelly Ring. Roy Leap. And Lee Hardy. Channel 13 Eyewitness News tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly Ring. And I'm Frank Robertson. Our top story tonight is still developing and we speak. It has For coverage you can count on 24 hours a day. Frank Robertson. Kelly Ring. Roy Leap. And Lee Hardy. Channel 13 Eyewitness News tonight. Good evening, I'm Kelly Ring. And I'm Frank Robertson. Our top story tonight, rape charges against two Clearwater High School football players. The alleged victim, a drunken 15-year-old girl. Eyewitness News reporter Bob Barnard says the young men charged in the attack are popular student-athletes. If the student-athletes at this Clearwater High School varsity girls basketball game knew about the arrest, they didn't show it. Two of their classmates accused of raping a 15-year-old girl. Antoine Lepred, an 18-year-old senior, and Gary Whitman, also 18, charged with sexual battery. Both men on the Tornado's varsity football team, the boys in red. It's really a shock, you know. Anytime something like this happens, whether it's uh, directly related to school or outside of school, it, uh, it certainly affects uh, the total program. Clearwater police say the alleged rape happened Halloween night here in the downtown area. Police say Gary, Antoine, and another 18-year-old had been out with three girls and had bought them booze. After dropping two of the girls off, they brought the victim to a downtown parking lot 
where she says both Gary and Antoine attacked her. The girl also says she was highly intoxicated. While some students get their thrills on the basketball court, others, says Principal Evans, get it from a bottle. We do have a problem with alcohol, and I think it's uh, not just countywide, uh, it's statewide, worldwide. Alcohol is, uh, is something that, that young people think that uh, it's a thing to do on Friday or Saturday night. On a team with more losses than wins this season, Antoine Lepred had become a role model of sorts, a former dropout turning his life around, succeeding not only on the gridiron, but in the classroom. Lepred, a contender for comeback player of the year, would seem to have fumbled near the goal line. In Clearwater, Bob Barnard, Channel 13, Eyewitness News. At this hour, the boys remain in jail on $50,000 bond each. They'll make their first appearance in court tomorrow. Because of the nature of the alleged crime and the age of the alleged victim, Authorities say nothing else about the girl except to tell us her age. South Florida police are looking for an alleged carjacker and kidnapper tonight. 27-year-old Kelly Donahue told police she was abducted while in Winter Haven and then taken for a 180-mile ride. The gunman made Donahue stop near Palm Beach so he could use the restroom, and that's when she ran for help. So far, the suspect has not been caught. Good news for a Tampa couple whose little girls never made it home from school today. Three-year-old Lanisha Vernon and five-year-old Shatavia Dunbar are safe tonight. They left their elementary school and walked to the boys' club down the street. But it made for some frantic hours while their parents tried to find out exactly where they were. Cable's public access TV is taking a bruising once again. There's a move on to tone down the outrageous medium. But as Eyewitness News reporter Trina Robinson tells us, those who want the channel cleaned up didn't show up tonight for a meeting with that very aim. Some would find these pictures of women bearing their breasts objectionable. But this is mild in comparison to what is sometimes shown on cable's public access channel. And because some of the programming rates is outlandish and even borderline obscene... We will take everybody's information you. who wants to come to the meeting. A handful of folks who showed up at tonight's cable advisory meeting say it should be outlawed. When I see two women French kissing and then nursing on each other's breasts and then rubbing each other in the pubic area, then what is community standards? What are my rights? And it's that kind of outcry from some citizens that may prompt Cable's advisory committee to recommend that what's now untamed, titillating, and unbridled be censored by a set community standard. What we're trying to look at is, are there in this community a set of standards that the majority of people hold. They determined the standard by allowing citizens to sound off at five road shows around the county. But if tonight's meeting is a barometer of that standard, the committee may have to butt out. And you have absolutely no right to take anything from me. Zero. Live on tape is probably the most controversial show. Its producer says he'll push the limit whatever it is. But I would put my show on, it would still be on the edge of wherever they put the boundary at. In the end, it may be difficult to come up with a community standard that satisfies just about everyone. Trino Robinson, Channel 13, Eyewitness News. The advisory committee will make a recommendation to Tampa City Council and Hillsborough County Commissioners. Then they'll have the final say on whether a community standard should be imposed. Cheryl Atkinson. Paul Delegato's weather. Chip Carter on sports. Channel 13 Eyewitness News at 11. Good evening, I'm Cheryl Atkinson. Our top story, Litchfield, Illinois officials have not yet charged the babysitter who allegedly stabbed to death an 11-year-old boy yesterday and sexually assaulted three young girls. That's because the suspect is still in the hospital at this hour after apparently turned the knife on himself. Dave Simons reports. Authorities say an 11-year-old boy was murdered. His sister and two of her friends who were spending the night were sexually assaulted. The suspect, the family babysitter, 37-year-old Leonard Johnson, who lives just two blocks from the victim's home. It happened so close, within 100 feet or so, you never expect something like that in a small town, I guess. Maybe in a bigger city, but not here in Litchfield. <laughs> 
After driving Johnson home, police say Mr. and Mrs. James Emerson returned to hear their seven-year-old daughter claim Johnson had sexually assaulted her. The couple rushed her to St. Francis Hospital and called police. Meanwhile, the girl's brother and her two friends were left unattended at the Emerson home. When police arrived, they found that a screen in a front window had been cut. Inside, they found a suspect holding two girls hostage. Once they finally talked that suspect into releasing the two girls, police entered the house, only to find that 11-year-old Donald Buskey was dead, his throat cut. This suspect, any previous trouble with him at all? None at all. We've never had any dealings with him through the police department. Police say Johnson tried to kill himself during the hostage standoff. He's recovering from self-inflicted stab wounds at a Springfield hospital. Police say once he recovers, he'll be transferred from the hospital to jail. And the charges would, of course, include first-degree murder. A three-year-old girl almost drowned today swimming in the water off the Gandhi Bridge. Someone saw Jessica Leal floating, floating face down. No one knew how long she'd been there, but witnesses say her stomach was bloated with water. A witness gave her CPR, and an air ambulance flew her to a hospital where she was reported in stable condition. But a few hours ago, she was transferred to All Children's Hospital. They aren't releasing her condition. Hillsborough Sheriff's detectives have arrested a man, or rather found the man they were looking for, to question about the death of a Bennigan's night clerk, but they released him today without charging him. Tonight, they say they still have no suspects. The doors open tonight for the first time since the body of one of the restaurant's managers was found inside yesterday morning. Those who worked with 33-year-old Cheryl McMullen voted to open this evening in her name, donating all the proceeds to a memorial fund. How, how are the employees acting tonight? Um, very cordial, very nice. I think maybe a little solemn. Yeah. You know, they seem to, you know, seem to be a lot of help tonight. They made an effort to be very warm and cordial and thank us for coming, and I guess they're glad to be open again. Sheriff's detectives are still looking for McMullen's killer and say they have no suspects. Trouble off the coast of Key West for a freighter bound for Tampa. The Coast Guard says the vessel has sent out a distress signal saying it's taking on water. A Coast Guard helicopter has dropped pumps down to the ship, but it's not clear whether that will keep it afloat. The vessel was carrying cargo of steel beams to Tampa. Investigators think arson just may be what caused a huge Tampa fire that burned down an empty new house and damaged the one next door today. It pretty much ruined the planned Mother's Day celebration for the Gore. From your 24-hour news source, Frank Robertson, Kelly Ring, Roy Leaves Weather, Andy Hardy on Sports, Channel 13 Eyewitness News at 11. It's a catfight in Pasco County, a battle over what to do with the thousands of felines overrunning the place. Good evening, I'm Frank Robertson. And I'm Kelly Ring. And our top story tonight, an agonizing decision that faces the people who run Pasco County government. Right now, a cat without a tag that's captured by animal control can be euthanized, killed within 24 hours. But there is talk of changing that. And as Eyewitness News reporter Kim Keeler tells us, the talk is charged with emotion. Playful, wide-eyed, adoptable, but homes are found for only a very small percentage of the stray cats brought into Pasco County's Animal Control Center. So up to 40 cats a day are euthanized here along with the dogs, some less than 24 hours after they're captured. That's why I'm here. I'm looking for a solution. I do not enjoy killing cats. The county's animal control director tells commissioners the cats vastly outnumber the dollars available to house them, and there's often no choice but to kill them right away. Who the hell needs more parts? We need some for the animals. Animal control's policies enrage many who worry they'd never even know it if their cat was put to sleep. They're putting the pressure on the commission to enact change. Cats are a thing of love, and many people don't have children. And this takes the place of children. The county's Humane Society is the primary opponent to the animal control methods. Animal control, one of their objections is that you know, they don't want the other animal shelters doing this because then people might have to call three or four places looking for their pet, but it's better to call three or four places looking for your pet than looking in an incinerator. The difference here at the Humane Society shelter is that healthy, adoptable cats like these are kept indefinitely. 
It's operated by private donations and takes only 300 cats to the county's 4,000 a year. Housing that many just isn't possible. Next week, commissioners will consider finding the funding to keep the cats five days before putting them to sleep. They'll consider mandatory spading and tags, but still, for many of these creatures, the fate remains the same. Kim Keeler, Channel 13 Eyewitness News. Now, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals says in seven years, one female cat and her young can multiply to 420,000 cats. 11 o'clock and all is well in Miami. Police hit the streets early before nightfall to prevent the kind of rioting that struck the city's Haitian community last night. They enforced a strict rule, stay on the sidewalks. It worked. And Haitian immigrants protesting the overthrow of Haiti's president, jean Bertrand Aristide, kept their outrage in check. As for President Aristide, he's in South America. He promises to return to his country and restore democracy. Surprisingly, little information is coming out of Haiti itself. We still haven't seen any pictures from there, but indications are that factions of the army are fighting among themselves. And a human rights group says some 100 people have died as a result of the coup. Well, imagine coming home to find your house being raided by police. That's the ordeal a Texas family is facing tonight. Residents say this is normally a quiet neighborhood, but today police were all over the place and the shooting began. A neighbor took these pictures of the raid as it happened. The owner of the house was not inside at the time. He drove up to see his house surrounded by police. Wrong place. Said my house, my house looks suspicious. Said the house don't around this neighborhood don't have a house like this one. But they said, yo, you can see this. I said, why y'all, why y'all get my house? And I've been working a long time to fix my house up. Police say they had the right house based on the search warrant. There will be an investigation to make sure the information on the warrant was correct. An advisory out tonight for Tampa cops. They'll be watching a just-released convict to make sure he doesn't make a false move. In case you come in contact with a subject, he is to be considered armed or extremely dangerous. And this is the man they're talking about, Luis Villabol. He's back in Tampa tonight after serving just 16 months of a four-and-a-half-year sentence for aggravated battery and assault. His release frightens Beth Moore, who says Villabol has stalked her family for six years, setting cars on fire and shooting at her husband. Villabol says he has no intention of harming the Moors. Keeping an eye on crime tonight, St. Petersburg police are investigating a shooting on 15th Avenue South. One person was taken to Bayfront Medical Center. Other Bay Area dispatchers tell us things are relatively quiet at this hour. Well, anyone in Florida who is thinking about buying a gun will now have to deal with a three-day waiting period. That became the law today. Officers who like the waiting period say it will prevent suicides and crimes of passion. But some opponents say it could actually hurt law-abiding citizens. Let's say if a woman's had an abusive husband or whatever, a boyfriend, she's had him locked up, he's vengeful. He gets out of jail, calls her up, and says, you're next. I'm coming for you. And, of course, past history proves that he's not bluffing. She can't arm herself uh, because she has to wait three days. Authorities agree the new law is not a cure-all, but they say if it saves even one life, it is worth it. The man who fell 50 feet from a billboard catwalk is in critical condition tonight. That word from the hospital.